Landlord and tenant. It's like oil and water. They just don't normally mix. Every property lawyer has probably got books galore on their shelves behind them. It's a separate subject at law school. I know well. I did law. I avoided landlord and tenant um, very, very quickly, made sure I never did it. Um, for centuries, lawyers have been trying to find a balance between what very historically was the haves and the have-nots. I don't need to give you a a social perspective of that, but if you've ever watched um, any old movies of you know, historic times, landlord and tenant, they were just that far apart. We're not that far apart anymore. Um, there are still the haves and have-nots, but there's also the have landlords and the tenant who did have and will have again, doesn't have right now. And in, interestingly, and this surprises a lot of people, there's not a lot of tenants who are landlords just because of their own mobility and jobs and change of circumstances. So we're going to talk and have a look about uh, landlords and tenants. It's something I know a little bit about, but I really needed to find somebody who knows a lot about it. And the best person that I know is Hannah, who is one of my good friends, who's also in Define, works in London, but her knowledge covers everywhere. Hannah, welcome to the Sunday Property Breakfast. Thank you very much, Adrian. That's very kind. Absolute pleasure to have you in the cavern, uh, which is our second home for property breakfasting. Um, we're going to dig into what's going on in landlord and tenant. Some of it, which will be, uh, I'm hoping there might be a bit of humour, but quite a bit of it's quite serious stuff going on at the moment. But probably a good idea just to say a little bit about who you are and why you're sitting in the expert chair this week. <laughs> of course. Thank you. Um, so I started working in property in about 2010 um, and I got straight into the very busy, very dynamic world of lettings. Um, I was extremely lucky to live through this period where renting has become more of a lifestyle choice. Um, and that's been really fun as that's developed because the quality of the properties has improved. A lifestyle choice for the tenants. Yes. Yeah, yeah a lifestyle choice for tenants. Um, the qualities of the properties have improved. The type of tenants that we see is more varied and more interesting. Um, so I run a number of estate agencies and um, lettings departments in London um, for a period of about 12 years. Um, and as we'll discuss, sometimes over a period of time, landlords choose to sell their properties. And for me, I wanted to continue to work with those clients and to be able to sell their properties as well, which has led me to where I am now, where I can do sales and lettings um, and all the wonderful things that we do at Define. <clears throat> so from a personal point of view, you will always have that lettings background and will always help people on lettings. But you're going to use that to have a better understanding of your vendor landlords um because you know what they go through you know what they have dealt with maybe what they're currently dealing with with the existing tenant while you sell or what to do with the property so that's going to become your niche for want of a better description absolutely i already speak the language you already speak the language which is and it's i think it's just the psyche isn't it i could learn the language but i can't suddenly get that 10 or 12 years of having dealt with them yeah. we have a few rental properties but there's a massive difference between looking after a few and doing what you do, which I would never want to touch with a barge pump. <laughs> so what's going on right now or in the last few months, years, however far you want to go back in the whole lettings landlord tenant market? What's what's going on out there? Of course. So in the last couple of years, we will start in 2020. We all know what was happening that year um, and prices came down dramatically and um, they needed to because people were only moving if they absolutely had to yeah. um, and we saw prices coming down by about 20 percent in the space of a year which is something we never normally see for lettings and prices lettings prices lettings okay. rental, prices. Yeah, rental prices um and in 2021 we had freedom day as it was so called <laughs> at the time everyone came flooding back and prices shot up to much higher than they have been previously. And we've never really seen that come back down. So okay. every year rents have been increasing. The amount by which they have been increasing has slowed. Okay. But that really is not a dramatic um, change. That okay. still means very high prices. And that's happened during a period of uh, cost of living yeah. going through the roof, rental going through the roof, which is part of that cost of living rise but it's not to be distorted by you know fuel and food and everything else so you've got tenants and this is national by the way i know that 
the, the figures in London are more extreme because the figures are always and and it's quicker moving. But although your experience is London, ninety percent of this experience translates to the whole country, particularly to where we we have our businesses. Yeah. Um, and that supply and demand uh, balance, there is still the same demand um, from tenants. Do you, you seeing that? drop off at all or increase at all broadly so with how the market has been last year and this year we know that the mortgage market became increasingly challenging last year yeah and this impacts first-time buyers so buyers who have been about to enter um being homeowners rather than tenants waited okay And that means that they remained in rental properties that would have been coming back to the market. So we had an increase in demand for the rental market over the last year that we wouldn't have had. Um, And that keeps supply back from the market. Tenants are renewing Renewing. for longer than they'd expected to. Um, But otherwise, demand remains extremely high. We're still seeing plenty of people coming into the UK and into London for schools and for jobs and for universities. In the same way that they come out to Hampshire or go down to Cornwall for a change of lifestyle. They're, you know, it, London may be a a, a, a funnel from the world, mm. but the rest of the UK then is a funnel from the other cities in the, in the, in the country as well. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And people that are coming to the UK are much less London centric now than ever before because okay. of the way that we live our lives has changed since the pandemic. Yes, yeah. So they don't need to be based in London. They can come in one day per fortnight, one day per week, maybe one day per month if they have jobs in London at all. Um, so I think demand we've seen really rise in rental areas outside of London that might not have been possible before. I've got an anecdote on that, which I hadn't even thought about before. <clears throat> I was chatting to a very good friend of mine down in Cornwall who works in a shared workspace, a bit similar to where we film these. And I said to her, you know, who shares those workspaces? And she described it as Shoreditch-on-Sea. She said, I'm the only Cornish-born person. Although she's come up to London to work and has now gone back, everybody else is very – a lot of them are in the uh, sort of media um, business, Uh, not to say filmmakers, but they're all in sort of the arts and the media. And they all would have worked in London, but they're now all living in Newquay. And enjoying the lifestyle of Newquay. And then when they need to come up to London, they, they do. But they are doing most of that by Zoom, by email, by, you know, the way we all now communicate. So I, I get that whole thing now that when somebody comes over from wherever to London, yeah. they're saying, yeah, I may have a job in London and my business may be in London. But I'm going to go and live in Hampshire and mm-hmm. live on the coast. I'm going to go and live in, they might not go to North Wales and Scotland in quite <laughs> the same way. But suddenly the, the, the country is a bigger place. Absolutely. And it gives them more options of property types might come to Hampshire and have a garden because they've got a dog with them. There are all sorts of amazing options. You must know our buyers very well. That's a huge (laughs) motivation. Dogs, dogs. I mean, we've still got jobs and an economy, but it's bigger garden, more space, Mm -hmm. dogs, schools. Those are the huge driving forces, um, particularly in, particularly in the Hampshire market. Um, There's three words that might strike fear into you um, and strike uh, sort of ignorant fear into me, which is rental reform bill, um, which has been a headline for mm, a couple of years or so under the old government. We've now got a change of government. So just to give people a little bit of a background who either have never heard of it or know the headline, but not much else, what is it all about and what do you think the change of government will mean to to that if that's not too many questions in one (laughs) i'll give it a go i'll remind you part the way through yeah please (laughs) if i need to the the rental reform bill um, was proposed by the conservative government and and that was approved in may this year and this is a set of different changes um, that are being proposed to rental structure the main headline one which you might have heard of is the scrapping of no fault evictions Um, which is the removal of the ability for a landlord to serve a Section 21. Um, There are also talks about ending bidding wars, um, that tenancies will be open-ended and rolling. um, And we've just heard from the King's speech that what Labour are going to propose 
is really a copy and paste of what existed already. So okay. no dramatic What existed changes. as proposed legislation. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Same same proposal. They are changing the name. You might be in it. So um, they're rebranding it, really, you know. <laughs> it has been rebranded. It's now the uh, the renter's rights bill. Okay. Um, besides that, no big dramatic changes. And one thing that had been a concern, Labour had been talking about um, ending Section 21s as soon as they came into power by separating it from the bill, pushing yeah. it through on its own very rapidly. Okay. Um, we now know that's not going to happen. Um, and David Cox, the chief exec at ARLA, is saying that we're not really going to hear anything next until October. Once October comes, there will be amendments, drafts, and then obviously an implementation date into the future. So okay. this is not going to be happening immediately i'd be surprised if this happens this year at this stage okay because um, they've got they are you know again without getting political they put a lot of they've got a big agenda that they put forward and they had a yeah. disrupted agenda with what's been going on in the last couple of weeks on the streets which is i'm sure taking taking some of their attention away from what they wanted to do Arla, just for those who don't know um who, who what it, what does that stand for and who are Arla? it's the association of registered lettings agents Right. I just wanted to check. And yes, I, thought, I nearly I guessed it. I nearly guessed it, but I thought I've got, I think I might have got a bit of it wrong. There's armor as well. Is that managing agents, or is that no? Do you, are you thinking is of that, Marla? Uh, maybe Marla. Anyway, we're Marla. It sounds <laughs> like we're going down a musical route for classical music. Um, the Section Twenty One notice. Um, would it be say, fair to say that it's almost a bit of a red herring? That it's it's been flagged up as this big part of this reform, but in fact its retention or abolition is not necessarily the be all and end all of being able to be, if I was a landlord of actually saying to a perfectly good tenant, I actually need my house back. Is that still going to be possible under what the, the proposed amendments? I, I think that's a really good take on it. And that would be what I would be saying to landlords at the moment as well. And what I am saying to my landlords is that calling the ending of section 21s, the end of no fault evictions, it sounds fantastic. And yes, tenants need to be protected. They're paying huge amounts of rent. Um, and we want to make sure that they are being looked after and that they get as much help and support as possible. But mm. there will be still plenty of ways that a landlord can end a tenancy when the tenant isn't at fault. Um, so yeah. if a landlord needs to so sell I just the need property, my house back because my, of my own personal change of circumstances and I've let it, I've got a brilliant tenant behaving well, paying well, never hear a dicky bird from them. If I just need my own roof over my head, which I own, I will still have that power to be able to do that. That is what we believe yeah, at the moment, yeah. 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 The, if you need to move back into your property, if a landlord has lived in a property before and they need to move back in, that is one of the grounds for possession as it exists, okay. and there is currently no proposed change to that. So as a little finesse on that then is if I bought it as a buy-to-let investment... I wouldn't be able to plead the I need the roof over my head because it was bought as an investment. So that would weaken that argument? It would weaken the argument. Um, but if it was a financial argument of I cannot afford to own this property because my net returns are lower because my mortgage has gone up or my tax the taxation of lettings, were, that's a little bit historic. That's slightly old news. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll maybe touch on that in a moment in terms of new landlords coming into the marketplace. But if you've got uh, a situation where financially the landlord needs to sell, otherwise they're going to be, you know, facing their own default, then that's a that's a strong way to to get the property marketed. And so, okay, yeah, it's yeah. for a judge. That's a what we call a discretionary ground. So, you would take that evidence to to a judge who would grant possession, depending yeah. on that. But so, presumably, for most of the people, and I imagine this is quite often the case that a headline distorts what most people really want to talk about. I imagine for most people in the lettings business, all the talk about that section 21 is in a way deflecting from all the other good, bad or indifferent stuff that is part of the legislation. It's become the talking point and the other bits aren't being discussed. And some of them will be, and I'm not, I don't want to go into them, but I imagine some of them are really good ideas. Some are not not so sure. And some of them are, that's not necessarily the best thing to happen. But it's all been dominated by this one bit, which arguably may not even be that important. It's it's a change that I think very few people will actually feel the impact of. Um, How often that, have you seen them used in your time out of interest? So when I was running um, lettings departments, I'd be looking after portfolios of you know, up to a thousand properties. 
And I could count on one hand the amount of Section 21s we would serve in a year. Um, wow. So if you think about it in a Gosh. in a reasonable way, there are very few reasons that a landlord would want a property back um, besides rent arrears, yep. which there is already Perfectly cause good, yeah. To, yeah. to remove them for, and um, antisocial behavior from a tenant, yep. that's already covered by a separate ground for possession, yep. needing to sell the property or needing to move back in. There are very few reasons a landlord would remove a tenant yeah. for no reason. Because let's be honest, most... Um, and we're by the way, most of this advice we're targeting towards the landlord with one property, maybe two properties. We're not looking here at the um, the serial landlords, the, the the landlord businesses, you know, the business landlord. Um, I think any of you who are in that category should know what you're doing. Um, if you don't, then you need to go, you need to phone me and I'll put you in touch with Hannah. So we're focusing on the smaller smaller businesses from that point of view. If you were to say to most people, most landlords, most part-time landlords and that's not being rude because it's an important thing that they're doing an important thing that you're looking after if you say what's your biggest fear they probably say void periods you know yeah. not having a tenant so there's going to be very few reasons why they're going to say i really want to get rid of my tenant unless unless there is this genuine reason of the tenants not behaving well or i need it back yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. and you know i would always say as we always have that prevention is better than cure yes and Find the right tenant, keep them in place for a long time. Avoid period costs much more um, than you could imagine. Yeah. And if you have a good tenant who is paying the rent, you can keep them for a long time. And that comes back to something we wasn't necessarily thinking of in terms of discussing where we are in the market. But this just comes back to a basic thing of it's a huge investment. It is also a physical thing it's not a trust of money or it's not a, a bank account this is a living and breathing thing that has living and breathing people in it so it mm. needs needs looking after needs to make sure it's the investment is still healthy and working and getting its best return and so all of that is absolutely critical to to the role you role you play yeah absolutely and i think it's something that gets lost a little bit in all this get rid of these bad tenants, I need my house back. No, the important thing for an agent is to look after your your house and to make sure that right at the beginning we pick the best possible tenants we can so we don't end up with those issues down the line. Yeah. That presumably is a situation made easier by high demand, lower supply. Yeah, But absolutely. in times of when the market's more level or indeed balanced the other way, and I can't imagine at the moment a scenario of that, but presumably... If you've got a lesser number of tenants, then the temptation is to to squeeze somebody into something that's a little bit inappropriate. We, we've got one locally where people have always wanted to put a dog in the property, but it's a relatively small house. Um, it's newly refurbished, one bedroom with wooden floors, and the landlord is a dog owner, but says, doesn't suit. Mm. And, I, and it would be very easy. We've had people say, we'll pay you up front, we'll pay you more, we'll take it for two years. It sounds good on paper but the wear and tear of that property will be higher. Absolutely. That's an important consideration. I think sometimes what can get lost is that the first tenant is not always the best tenant. Yeah. Um, and yes, in a market with really high demand, you can have the luxury of making sure that you pick the right tenant. As long as you have a really good relationship with your agent who knows yes. who you're looking for, who is going to be patient with you, um, who's going to discuss the options, and then you can choose the best tenant yes. for the property. Yeah. Um, and yeah, having that long-term view of how that tenancy is going to be rather than any short-term excitement over rent paid in advance. And so yes, on. yeah, yeah. That balance of the landlord's short-term financial headline and I'm actually looking after your you and your investment. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I can't imagine that's a really, I can't imagine you managed a thousand properties. I'm sure you had people working with you, but all the same, that's <laughs> still an awful lot. Um, we've talked about this huge tenant demand. Mm. I mentioned about we've had historic taxation changes that made the this very sweet buy to let market that we'd had for a long time just be less and less um, of an appetite for people. And we've had a situation where just because of the timing, people who bought buy to lets 15, 20 years ago as a pension fund are now actually selling them because they want to buy the speedboat or 
you know, go on the life lifelong cruise. Or is just, that what you would be buying, Adrian? I would be buying a speedboat. No, <laughs> no, I'd be I'd be actually creating a real living uh, recording studio in my house if if yeah, if I had Exciting. that lump, lump sum of money. Um, I'm being slightly fickle there about what they do with it, but we've just there's a whole series of things: taxation, yeah. um, legislation, which has made people say, "God, I don't want to have to jump through those hoops." And then we've had just an age thing whereby people have just matured their investment and they've sold it. Are we seeing just less and less properties? You mentioned how they're not being renewed mm. to new people because tenants are staying, but are we actually seeing the stock of available property dropping for rental? Yes, we are seeing the stock of available property dropping for rental. And you mentioned the changes in taxation. Um, so in 2016, we saw change that you could no longer offset the interest from your mortgage. And 2016, interestingly, was the first year that we saw a net loss in the number of landlords in the market. And right. that has been the case every year since. Okay. Um, but I think it's more interesting to look at the nuance of that, as you've already alluded to, that there is a lot of there are a lot of landlords who entered the market during the heyday of buy to let mm. during the 90s um, and have seen and tolerated a lot of changes over that time and are also now just organically coming to the end of the time where they want to be a landlord. Yes. Um, so there are a lot of people disposing of those properties. Um, and the majority of tenancies are fantastic, rewarding things to be involved in. Um, there's been a lot of talk about no-fault evictions and all of mm. these things, which I think is putting off some of the new yes. generation of landlords. Um, whereas in reality, it, this is really the very small percentage of tenancies where anything untoward might happen. Um, and if you come in now as a landlord you maybe do need to be a little bit more purposeful about what you choose to purchase and invest in rather than in the 90s where you could buy anything buy and it would be a fantastic return. Yeah. And um, A bit like, dare I say it, the doer-upper, I don't want to pick on Sarah Beanie because I actually quite like her, Sarah Beanie, but there were people on her programme who bought a doer-upper, spent way more than they should have done, but because the market was flying, they still made a profit, even though they'd actually broken all the rules of what she should have done or what she was advising them. It's a similar thing with the letting the market it, because it was so advantageous. Even if you bought the wrong property, didn't manage it very well, didn't get great tenants, you still did okay. Now you've just got to be sharper and keener. Back to business. If you've got whatever business people are in, if you've got a simple supply and demand thing and you've got this very strong demand that you don't see faltering um, because people are now post-COVID, in fact, it probably just accelerated people's mobility in jobs. I think there is a psyche amongst younger people under the age of 35 that why do I have to own my property? Um, I enjoy actually being able to say, I'm going to live here for a year and I'm going to go and live there for a year. Um, and I, I get that. It's a generational thing. But if you've got this constant demand, which we don't see dropping off, and you've got this supply that dropped and is still faltering, at what point do you think, uh, are we at the point where new people should be saying, do you know what, this is a really good opportunity to feed this strong, consistent demand. Absolutely. And there are new landlords joining the market all of the time, just not at the rate at the moment that landlords are leaving, leaving the market. But the people that stay in the market at the buy are going to see the benefit of those increases in rent. Um, and they and don't have the historic taxation legislation things. They, they're joining it as we are, this, the position we're now in, and saying this still works. Absolutely. And I, I do believe that as we start to see mortgage rates come down and we've seen buy-to-let lending improve over the last couple of days, yeah. um, that we will have a lit, that sort of delayed demand coming in from people who want to invest um, in property in the UK. We are still seen as such a safe haven for that investment of cash, whether that's from people that are already living here or from overseas, mm. um, and that being a landlord here can be a rewarding and still a profitable business. If you are investing wisely, you're looking at service charges, we're looking at our mortgage rates, we're looking at areas and deciding whether our priority is that monthly return, or whether it's capital growth, um, and choosing to provide homes to people. I presume, yeah, and of course, that you we're not exactly suggesting that landlords are going to be suddenly philanthropic overnight, but the fact that you are doing something as your investment that isn't just maybe feeding the um, the stock market or whatever. But actually, one of the things I've done is I've pro provided a home for that couple. And even though that couple may be very well off and very wealthy and very happy and, and all those things, 
in the stage of the stepping stone of the market, it means that there is another property for just more straightforward, regular people. It's providing a property in the housing market, which is still has a shortage across every, every price and every demographic in the whole country, whether you're buying, selling or buying or letting. So, yeah. yeah. So if I am an existing landlord, what should I be? I'm going to give you three scenarios here. Ooh. So uh, I'm going to talk about, first of all, we'll start with an existing landlord and one landlord, I've just got one property. Um, what should I be thinking of at the moment? And let's ignore the section 21 red herring. <laughs> what should I be thinking of right now about my, the future of my, my investment and my property? So I think it's always a good time to do a health check on your property. What's um, a health check? So there are a number of things that we can be looking into, but if you are inspecting your property annually or your agency is inspecting your property annually, and one of those things should definitely be happening, how, when was the last time that it was valued? Okay. Um, we still have a lot of tenants who moved in during that pandemic period. Has that rent been assessed? Has it been changed? Where is that rent level at? Um, our first advice and approach would always be, to look at raising that rent very slightly with your current tenants rather than going back out to the open market all of the time. A good tenant is worth so much to already have. Um, but yeah, checking but whether that's still rent have level. increments in rent. Absolutely. You're not you're not trying to get the highest market rent available from your really good existing tenant. But presumably if somebody's still paying today the same rent they were four years ago because they're a great tenant, the moment at which they can't rent that property they are going to have a real shock when they go back into the market and realize that what they were renting is now way, way more. Absolutely. It'd be really difficult for a tenant. I'm not suggesting they should always be paying, but no tenant's going to put that money aside thinking I'm paying 800 when I should be paying a thousand or 1500 when I should be paying two. They're never going to put that money aside, but truth is they, they could be faced with that problem. So, yeah. but the landlord just to say, doesn't maximize rent, but just, gets a better rent from existing and yeah i see how important that would be yeah just just having the knowledge mm. what you choose to do with that is then you know between mm. you and your tenant in the situation but mm. do we know where the market rent is at in in your area and how in line with that you are do you know what might be coming up with your building if it is a leasehold in terms yes. of service charges and major works that are coming up and um, and have you spoken to your mortgage advisor recently yes for a health check across your your current property that you live in, I presume, yes. and that you're renting out in terms yeah. of the rates that you're paying. And obviously if you're watching this and you're thinking, I actually don't know what my house is worth because, or my flat that I'm renting out is worth because it's either mortgage free and therefore it's really irrelevant or um, the mortgage is absolutely fine. We're obviously um, very happy to let you know what that may be worth. And indeed what we think the market rent may be, even if you're perfectly happy with your own tenants, so obviously we can step in on that as well. Um, and again, Within all of that, just the whole how is the house or flat being managed? Um, you know, are you making sure that you're not getting away with repairs, but actually looking after that asset where, again, £100 spent on repairing a gutter stops you spending £2,000 on a damp in the lounge wall when it leaks? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, classic stuff like that. And it can lead to a really long void period if your tenant yeah. chooses to leave. Or an unhappy tenant who says, I'm not going to, I don't know, I'm not going to keep my house looking really, really good because you didn't mm. repair my wall when it leaked because you didn't, going backwards, spend 100 quid repairing the gutter I told you about. Yeah, Absolutely. I get that. Second scenario, um, the lovely phrase accidental landlord. And for those who've not watched my note on this, where have you been? The accidental landlord isn't somebody who wakes up with a property portfolio. It's a property where the simple definition would be you didn't buy it for rental investment. So it's uh, maybe a first property you had, maybe in, um, um, something you've uh, inherited. Um, and so it was never bought initially as a property for, for rental. What would you suggest to the accidental landlord? Is it fairly similar advice, health check? <clears throat> I, yeah, I would recommend the same thing. And looking at is this actually something that although you came to it accidentally, you're now enjoying? Is this something where you can see yourself being a landlord for the much longer term? Um, in which case, could you be more purposeful about the property that you're choosing to rent out? It might be that this is actually working really well, but perhaps 
a property in a different area might come with a higher yield or might come with lower maintenance costs. Okay. It could be a time to pivot if you wanted to sell that property and look at a property which you've designed, you've purchased with being a landlord in mind. Yes. Whereas the current property you have, you ended up being a, a landlord yeah. accident. Okay. The question we would ask, which probably matches then, is you ask that landlord, would you now buy this as a rental investment? Knowing what you know it now. It was your first time buying a home before you met your husband. It was the, the property you inherited from your, you know, your great aunt or whatever. Would you go out in the market and buy that? We had a scenario, uh, it's actually a couple of years ago, time flies. Client, it was their property um, that they lived in. They then were in a new relationship, living elsewhere, had done for four or five years and thought, I'm never going to go back to that property. And it was a 400-year-old cottage. Beautiful. But management-wise, you can imagine what it'd be like. Every other week it was taps don't work, bit of damp, you know, all the usual problems of a lovely old property. We sold it for her and bought a new flat for her, same rental yield, um, and she also was able to put £50,000 aside for speedboat or Amazing. <laughs> whatever else. And that's the case in point, really, with an accidental yeah. landlord. It may be working for you, but it could work better. Yeah. You touched on, are you enjoying this? Are you thinking, if this works, you want to keep it, do you actually want to maybe refinance it and buy another? Is that Was that part of your thinking? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, if you've become a landlord by accident actually this is something that people set as their goal um something that people desire mm. is to to get involved in in the property world and start making investments and if you are enjoying it how could you add to that what could the next property in your portfolio look like um is there any equity yeah. that you can draw out and likewise start if you hate to... it then get out of it absolutely we'll, we'll find somebody else who does yeah. also that is it time to sell and to look at doing something else yeah. that's always an option little side question hmm. i'm an accidental landlord. i'm not i'm, I'm right. the scenario is i'm an accidental landlord and i've got a property eh, it's all right but I'm, I'm i just it's not really my thing I, I just you know i'd rather put my money into my own house or something mm -hmm. else but it's a brilliant investment because you've been renting it out void free for eight years. Maintenance has been minimal, one repaired carpet, you know, whatever. How easy is it to sell that as an investment with the tenant in with that whole guarantee? So that the new landlord's fear of voids is, OK, I'm buying an existing investment. How easy is that? And is that something that's happened quite a lot? It's definitely something that happens. Um, it. I, I would say it's a 50-50 in terms of appealing or not. What it will require is an agent who can proactively market that property yes. as the full package, as you've just very okay. well explained it, Adrian, that this is actually a property with a long-term, very reliable tenant. This is what the yields have looked like. This is what the maintenance have looked like. If you are working with an agent who just will like to put something on right move and let that do the work for them, that, that that will sit there and not be sold. Yeah, it will not explain itself. Um, in we right did way. sell one in Hartley Whitney a couple of years ago, just off the cricket green. That same scenario. A couple who, who owned it were in the RAF, mm. and they had RAF accommodation, so they bought a property to make sure they were on the property market. They moved to Canada, so they had to sell. And they had a tenant who'd been there for eight, ten, twelve years. I can't remember how long. A long time. And she really wanted to live there for another three years or so because of her children there before they left home or, or, or left education. And we sold it as an investment. Um, and although the landlord really loved, or the new buyer, sorry, really loved the property and thought that one day they might live there, they were able to assess it very much from a, a financial perspective and said, even if my circumstances change, this stacks up really well. Um, and uh, so I don't think it's the easiest thing, but I think you're dead right. We, we, we packaged it as buy this with the existing tenant. Don't talk about getting rid of the tenant because it's actually the landlord, the, the original owner wanted to try and help her because they, she'd been a brilliant tenant. Yeah. Um, and it was a win-win and thankfully it, it did all, all happen as we hoped. I've got one other scenario then, and we've talked about this new landlord, this mm. new potential investor, the supply and demand person is saying, in my own business, if I had that polarity, I'd be buying. Um, mm. What would your advice to them be about how to get into the market and what to buy? So I would suggest the first thing to do is to decide on what their goals are. So okay. where do they want to be 
in five to ten years' time? What do they wow. want this property to be doing for them? I over love that, that time answer. Period? Do you know? What I was, do you know? What, <laughs> I asked that question thinking you'd say, "Where do you want to buy? How much are you going to spend? You know, will you ever live in it?" So your first thought is, "Where do you want to be in five years?" Because this is for you. This is an investment. Absolutely. This isn't about the bricks and mortar. That's the vehicle for the investment. Yeah. Wow. That's the new a great answer. the new landlord entering the market. That is the the plan that is their goal they're looking to treat this as a serious investment as they should um and but we want to understand why what is it that is exciting about this for them is it that they want to be able to put their money somewhere keep it ticking over and in 10 years sell something for a much higher price than they paid for it that's going to be a different investment potentially to one that brings them in a really nice passive income every month okay and if you can get both of them, then tell me where it is and I will buy it myself. <laughs> um, but normally one or the other is okay. make sure that you have a priority and yeah. that you go towards So that. capital appreciation or, or income. Absolutely. You could buy a house in Middlesbrough at the moment and the growth on that over the next 10 years is going to be higher probably than a lovely townhouse in London. Yeah. But you are going to get a higher monthly rent on that townhouse yes. in London. Yes. So there are priorities at, at play. And this is where you are completely separating the property that you might buy and live in. This is coming back to the accidental landlord thing of, yeah. you know, my first time buy a flat, I've, I love it. And I, I've kept it now I'm married and whatever, but this is that the, the reverse situation of that, of you're buying this to get to there. Yeah. Um, which, which route do you want to go down? Passive income or capital appreciation? Don't buy something you really love and is cute. So using a local example, don't buy a cute cottage that you'd like to live in. Go and buy that functional flat, that nearly new mm. home that ticks a lot of boxes for tenants. There's a low management responsibility. Um, and, yeah, it works really, really well. Absolutely. You're almost, you talked earlier about all of your rental advice being brilliant for landlord selling. But presumably all of that background advice Advice and knowledge that's just in your head is brilliant for new buyers on what what not to buy. <laughs> yeah, what what to buy and what not to buy. And no disrespect to Middlesbrough, I'm sure there's lots of lovely people living there. Though I'm not aware of anybody watching these. But now, if Middlesbrough's mentioned, it might flag up and people watch this. But that is the whole perspective. It's I'm likening it to the stock market. Don't buy necessarily shares in a great wacky trendy company whose shoes you wear or clothes you wear or music you buy buy something that's actually going to get you to where you want to be and if Middlesbrough or wherever is the vehicle for that don't try and buy something where you can't get what you want yeah, yeah and absolutely. Get, yeah it's a really really good way of thinking about it and that's a big change in this demographic of landlords that we've talked about whereas traditionally landlords wanted to be a couple of streets away so that they could be on the doorstep, they could check on the property all of the time. Even they, though you they wanted to do everything them, themselves. Them there, yeah. Well, you know, and a lot of landlords didn't like to have agents manage them, manage it for them. And this was, again, this <laughs> how it was in the yeah. 90s and the early 2000s. Mm. And now we have people who are coming in who want to look at this like an investment, who can choose to invest anywhere across the country and there will be good agents. How many bits of legislation does a landlord need to know? Is it like 150 or something? Uh, yeah. It's pretty scary, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, a scary number I don't like to use because it scares people, Adrian. <laughs> but I think it's a good scare for somebody who says, hey, I really want to buy this yeah. property for investment. Don't manage it yourself. No. You know, there is a reason why people like you Absolutely. exist. Absolutely. And because I've got all this knowledge of what's going on and the legal knowledge. We've talked about the relationship mm. knowledge, the... The, the just the the skills and experience knowledge but there's also that legal technical knowledge that is a must-have otherwise you are breaking the law as a landlord absolutely which is, that's the scary bit that's more scary than knowing there's 150 bits of legislation is knowing that if you don't get the right advice you could be breaking the law without realizing it absolutely not, there are so many clever. so many things a landlord can do completely innocently just purely by not knowing that means that at present they couldn't serve a Section 21 in any case. That's interesting. Um, and I'm sure that that's happening, happening all around. If you think that you would like to manage your property yourself and you're a new landlord, have an agent manage it for the first year. And if you talk to them about how much they've done and what has been put in place and so on, and then you think, I could do that, then that's great. But don't try and do it the first what, time. If there are 100 people mm. who bought a property and had it managed by you, <laughs> After one year, how many would say, oh, I can do this myself? 
Or how many would realize, realize wow, <laughs> I'm never going there again? Yeah. I, uh, yes. I think I, you'd be at 100, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yes, I do. I think I that is why I give that advice. what you were going to say is that if you're thinking of buying this for investment and it stacks up because you've got rid of the management charge and you're going to do it yourself, um, if you're thinking of doing that as a new landlord, go and have a cold bath, <laughs> go and, you know, shove a wet flannel on your face, have a drink if you're a drinker, mm -hmm. and come back tomorrow morning and say, actually, I'm now going to work on the basis that I'm paying somebody to look after it for me. Absolutely. Um, which is the best way forward. Hannah, incredibly enlightening. You've told me some stuff which I knew, um, but you've told me loads more stuff that I really didn't know or had inklings of, and there's some bits in there which I'd never even thought about as well. This isn't an A to Z of lettings, but you have the A to Z of lettings <laughs> in that head of yours. So if you've got any lettings questions, um, just please um, let me know. I can pass them straight on to Hannah. She works with us at Define, um, and you may be up in London, but, well, you're sat here with us today. That's how close yeah. we all are. And we're back to see you next week as well. So, you know, we're, we're in, to in contact all the time. Thanks so much for watching Sunday Property Breakfast, listening to it whenever you were. Uh, we've got some great ones coming up. Uh, I think surveys is next week's one, which is probably even more dry than lettings can be. But these <laughs> are me. always not done for fun, although there was a fair bit of fun in this one. But it's just to help you um, buying and selling and owning property. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to the Sunday Property Breakfast podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. Please feel free to share it with anyone you know who you think might benefit from these exclusive market updates. And if you have a question that you'd like us to answer directly, then just email adrian at adrian at define, that's D-F-I-N-E dot co. See you next week.